going to tell you how I got out of that. So, <laughs> radical design for sustainability. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, how we got to a state of unsustainability before I get into what we're trying to do about it. Uh, one proposal has been the triple bottom line of sustainability. Then I'll get into the quadruple bottom line of sustainability, which expands the remit a little bit further um, and talks about inner values and spirituality a little bit more. And then I'll finish off with some propositional objects which I construct in order to try and synthesize some of the ideas into designed objects. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. How do we get into uh, a state of unsustainability? It all starts really with a period we call modernity, which started around the 1500s with, with uh, developments in science and philosophy, really got going around the 1750s with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, continued through the 1800s into the 20th century. Um, and around the middle of the 20th century, when we'd learned uh, what all this industry and progress was doing, which was, was great hope for, but by the middle of the 20th century, we realized that we're also using it to kill each other in large numbers. And so some of the, the assumptions of modernity started to break down around the 1950s and so on after the Second World War. And we started to enter into a period we call post-modernity, which we can briefly describe as late 20th century, early 21st century life. That's the period we call post-modernity. Nevertheless, the ideas of modernity are still very dominant. They still dominate our systems, our ways of thinking, and our ways of doing. But essentially, as ideas, they are dead. What does modernity mean in terms of how we think about ideas? Well, what it did was it split knowledge up into compartments. So cognitive knowledge went off into one department, and was used in science for the advancement of science, the, the observation and the analysis of the natural world. Ethics and justice and morality went off into the social sciences. Art went off into the, uh, into the art department. And spirituality, religion, profound uh, values, meaning, basically dropped out of the mix. And so what became prevalent and prominent in modernity uh, was cognitive knowledge. This became the privileged form of knowledge uh, within the period of modernity, which is about empirical evidence, evidence-based research. This became the source of what we call reliable knowledge. And that fed into scientific advancement, which is our idea of progress, this continual advancement of the observation and analysis and understanding of the natural world. Uh, that's what we call progress. So far, so good. But then we took that scientific knowledge and advancement and we started to use it in different ways. We started to apply it. And that's values-based. So what we value became applied into technologies. So it's application, innovation, and technologies. And then that use of technology started to become mass-produced. So we mass-produced those technologies, and then we, then we started to sell them. So that's Western-style capitalism. This is this idea of growth, growth based on innovation and technology, and then mass production, and then selling it. So consumerism. And design has always been a close uh, ally of that. We, in design, we create these beautiful, seductive objects for people to buy. And so it, it helps to drive consumerism, traditionally. And then we take that global. So within a laissez-faire economic system, that goes global. We break down trade barriers, and we, we export that idea of consumer-based growth throughout the world. The problem with that system is that it underprices resources, there's no title locale, and there's no sense of stewardship, and it externalizes all the costs, and it constantly encourages consumption. <clears throat> now, what's left out of that picture is that the polluters 
don't pay. It exploits nature like no other, no other civilization in the history of the world. It exploits people, treats people as units of production. And always along with this period of modernity has been accompanying this sense of meaninglessness. There's a sense of meaninglessness uh, in this period of modernity and into post-modernity. And most of all, of course, it's an inherently unsustainable system because we live on a finite planet and that's a continual growth model. And we see what that means here uh, when we constantly, this is a UN graphs, uh, seeking constant growth in GDP, which is what you hear all the time. We're seeking constant growth in GDP and you see accompanying that graph constant growth in materials extraction around the world. So that means digging up, mining, transporting, and so on. It also means, uh, as we go for an increase in GDP, an increase in energy use and emissions and so, and so on. And it also means exploit uh, exploiting people. An instrumental view of people where corporate, gov corporate governance externalizes the human costs and we basically leave our ethics at the door. Now, if we take a simple mass-produced product like this, and if you walk through the park on your way here this morning, you will have seen lots of these, uh, a mass-produced water bottle. So in this present state of this product, a disposable water bottle, it fully includes a lot of other present states, its origins and its protracted uh, destiny, lasting whatever, whatever that might be. So it means land use, roads, sites to put up oil derricks, drilling, pumping, pipelines, refining with all the energy use and pollution that that causes, manufacturing, shipping, around the world in container ships, distributing, vending, using, dis for a very brief period very often, uh, discarding, and then the littering that goes with all that. And sometimes, maybe, the collecting. So by accepting the present state of a disposable bottle, we implicitly accept all these other present states which are all linked to unsustainable ways of living. And this is just one product, of course, a disposable bottle. So we implicitly uh, accept this curve, this rising curve of environmental damage, habitat loss, materials use, energy use, emissions, climate change, landfill, and litter on the beaches, in the oceans, in the hedgerows, uh, in the parks. And it doesn't just apply to a plastic bottle. It applies to a host of disposable products from batteries to razor blades to plastic bags and a host of short-lived products. They might not be disposable but they're pretty close. Mobile phones, tablet computers, laptops, they don't last very long. Um, and then fast fashion. So what are we doing about this? Uh, in the 90s the triple bottom line for sustainability was put forward as a potential solution. Uh, which takes into consideration the environmental, the social, and the economic uh, aspects associated with our activities. The problem with the triple bottom line is that it's been around for a while, it's helped, uh, but it's not comprehensive. Um, it lacks relevance to the individual. These are all very large issues, society, the environment, the economy. And it differs from deeper, more profound understandings of human meaning, which has been, has been with us for a lot longer. And what it does, because they're all kind of equal players in that triple bottom line, in a monoculture which privileges the economy, that always comes to the fore. That always takes over. And then the other things, the social and the environmental consequences, always get pushed to the background. That's been the tendency. So we, so we distort the use of sustainability by talking about economic sustainability. Sustainability is not economic sustainability. It's all those things all together, which is what makes them so complex to, to handle. And so within that economic monoculture, when we try to deal with something from a sustainability point of view, we put a recyclable label, label on the back of the bottle, and we think we've done our job. But all those other things are left out of the picture. 
So the quadruple bottom line of sustainability, which is a notion I put forward in my last book, was expands this idea to practical meaning, which is a basic human need of practical meaning, utility and benefit, and its environmental consequences. The social ramifications of what we do and our activities in the world and what it means from a personal point of view in terms of inner values and spirituality. And as you can see in that diagram, I've pushed the economic to the back as an economic means, not a meaning, but a means, a way to achieve those other, th those other things. We can also uh, show it like this, where the, the red circles become the kind of lubricant to allow the other th others to, to work, if you like. And when we do this, when we flip it to this, we can, we can then turn that on its side. And we see that if we just look at the world in terms of practical utility and its environmental impacts, we take a fairly narrow view. If we then also include the social aspects of that, its, its influence on people, what are we doing as a society, where is it going, we open up our perspective. And then if we include the, the inner values, the, most, the meaning seeking, and spirituality, we open it up even more to have a much more complete picture of the world than a purely utilitarian view, which has dominated the period of modernity and into post-modernity. So we go from the mantra of, mo modern, of modernism and modernity, which was form follows function, to a sustainability saying, if you like, called Form follows meaning, so that we, we consider our actions in terms of meaning, human meaning. What are we doing? Where are we going? And these propositional objects I'll, I'll show you now, a few of them, are a way of trying to capture these ideas in form, to show and they're experimental products, they're not commercial uh, objects. Uh, they're, they're meant to explore and synthesize some of these ideas. So here was a very early one about reuse, where there's a soap bottle in a, in a, a simple lamp, uh, m combining local with mass production, because we can't do everything at the local level. But if we can do more at the local level, that can help an awful lot in terms of the environmental form for, fallout and allowing people to have j meaningful jobs that they're connected to within their local uh, environment. A lot of people think about uh, sustainability and long-lasting products, so I did a series of ephemeral products, single-use products, but th that have no ill effect on the, uh, on the natural environment. So the candle burns down, the potato goes in the compost, and the, the, the forks go uh, back in the drawer. Here's another one using fruit to power a, a digital clock. Uh, this was looking at reseeing, so reframing old technologies rather than regarding them as as rubbish items, linking it up to uh, uh, an MP3 or whatever, but reframing it, recontextualizing it, so we see it as a component within a larger composition so that we can revalue these things rather than putting them into landfill and then going out and buying another amplifier and speakers to power our MP3 player. This one quite explicitly binds a disposable battery and an electronic circuit thingy to uh, a natural element, to remind us where this stuff comes from and where it ends up going to. We've lost that tie, and here they're literally tied together to create an object which is explicitly expressing something of this relationship to the natural environment. We can take that a step further by thinking of a, a simple floor lamp like this, where we have the, the electrical components are all off the shelf. They weren't designed for this object in particular from a local hardware store. They're listed on the right. All the other components that the designer adds are completely natural, unprocessed materials for the most part, which can, at the end of its useful life, those components can be very easily separated. The natural components can be reabsorbed into the natural environment with no ill effect at all. And because they're off the shelf, the electrical components can be very easily reused. And so it could, we can just take a piece of paper, wrap it around it, and use it as the same components in a different uh, product. This was combining local cottage industries, knitting, patchwork, with hard drives and technology. These are all kind of small experiments to try and change how we think about objects and material culture. This one's bringing in some symbolism, which is the language of spirituality. Uh, uh, in, in addition to technology. So these are a series of memory objects. This one's got a USB stick. The brand, the label is very important with the, with the barcode, the brand, the name, the price. That's very important in our culture. Um, 
recycled materials, obviously. And this last one, um, land, uh, water, and air. The one on the, on the left is disposable ink cartridges, plastics, mixed materials. That's where they end up. Uh, the, the disposable batteries break down, absorb into the water supply. That's what they are doing. And every time we plug in that little charger, we're effectively turning on a tiny CO2 pump. So we need to think about these, these objects in different ways rather than just accept them unthinkingly because all these kinds of objects are at the heart of unsustainability. So in, in going in this direction, we move from a knowledge economy based on what we can do, where we've got that, and that's resulted in that exponential curve in greenhouse emissions, materials use, energy use, and so on. We move from a knowledge economy based on what we can do to a wisdom economy based on what we should do. And if you're interested in these ideas, this is the, the book that has these ideas in it, The Spirit of Design. Thank you very much.